All right, thanks for having us. I'll let the panelists uh, make their way up. So what we're gonna be talking about today, it's an interesting group. Uh, uh, I've been on panels with a number of folks here before, and the mix always changes. It's a little bit like the panel of Theseus, but we tend to talk about some of the same topics. Um, so the, the two main areas I think we're gonna talk about today are AI as product and ML ops. So these are two areas that I, that I think are getting a lot of attention right now. And when you think about it, we're seeing this burst of investment in AI-first products. Uh, from startups as well as from larger companies. Um, everything from intelligent assistance to smart physical devices, autonomous vehicles, smart feeds. Um, you think about TikTok, they're just giving you a smart feed of videos without um, a lot of user choice. Um, so AI is being infused everywhere. Um, but at the same time, you know, in a back channel, if you talk to people in this room, you'll hear stories of struggle and difficulty actually getting products out the door, long time frames, failed projects. Um, so with this kind of group here and with the veterans on the stage, um, I think this is a good opportunity to learn what best practices they've observed um, that you can take back to your own companies. Um, on the second topic, part of that may be this area of ML ops. So how do you um, build these products? What platforms are you using? What frameworks? What's still not there? What gaps are there in the dev stack? Um, so really interested to hear what people have to say and what's changed in the last few months since I've talked to uh, a number of them. So I'd like the discussion to be kind of free-flowing, but let's, let's start by everybody just giving a brief introduction. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Robert Monroe. I'm the CEO of Machine Learning Consulting. Uh, I work with large companies looking to bring machine learning uh, into their stack, especially when they have customers that don't want to hear the word uh, machine learning. Uh, so I've worked a uh, large number of startups and, and, and various executive roles. Um, I uh, launched AWS's first natural language processing and translation services, uh, Comprehend and Translate. Um, and I began my career as an engineer and scientist. So I got my, my PhD uh, just down the, the road here at Stanford. Hi, my name is Aliona, and I'm the CEO and co-founder at a company called Thematic. We analyze customer feedback to help companies understand what's driving their customer satisfaction, how to retain customers, how to prioritize better. And I started this company um, after I was consulting in the general area of natural language processing. I have a PhD in this field, and um, af actually after I graduated, I joined a startup that was unsuccessful, and I'll share a story later. So I really wanted to start my own company to solve a true problem, and um, it come, kind of came out from consulting, and we um, are based here in San Francisco, 15 people, and we work with companies like LinkedIn, DoorDash, um, Greyhound, Bus, helping them understand their customers. Uh, hi, so I'm, I'm Jennifer. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Alectio, which is kind of new or one year old. And uh, we focus on data curation and data collection, basically helping people make sense of the data they have, like knowing that the, the value proposition we offer is that uh, a lot of people have more and more data that they need to work with. And we actually believe that only a fraction of this data truly matters. And this is one of the ways of dealing with a large scale uh, uh, data sets and large scale models. Uh, prior to starting uh, my own company, so I was the VP of machine learning at Figure 8. I also had a, a series of interesting like positions at uh, Walmart. Uh, I uh, started data science and machine learning at Atlassian. And then, uh, yeah, I started my career interestingly as a particle physicist. Awesome. Uh, my name's Peter Bayless. I'm on the faculty at Stanford, uh, one of the members uh, and founders of the Stanford Dawn Project. A couple of us are here speaking today, or tomorrow, I think, at Kunle and Mate. Um, a lot of our work on campus was, you know, how do you avoid just making ImageNet a little bit more uh, accurate or overfitting even more on CIFAR 10 and figuring out how to make ML more usable. Did a bunch of work on performance benchmarking. Dawn Bench turned to ML Perf, and basically, like, what does end-to-end -end, uh, research, research into end-to-end -end machine learning product development actually look like from a statistical perspective, all the way down to new kind of hardware and computing models? Um, and I'm also the CEO and founder, uh, which is where I spend most of my time today, um, of a company called Sisu Data. 
So what we do at CSU and what I'm really excited about is, you know, you have more data inside of an enterprise warehouse. Like think about Snowflake and all the billboards you probably saw driving down here to get to, uh, you know, the 101 um, to the Computer History Museum. You know, there's just more data inside one of these warehouses than there was on the internet when Google launched, and yet the toolkit that uh, line of business owners have to use all this data is kind of like the same stuff since had since '95. So if we've got like the world's best structured private data in the history of humanity. You know, how to give people better tools and kind of banging rocks together, which is how I view the current analyst stack. Um, and that's basically human in the loop uh, recommendations and helping people understand why their metrics are changing. That's great. I'm tired of banging rocks together. So <laughs> I'm doing a lot of work in my backyard right now. So, um, so I, I think it would be interesting uh, to dive into the beginning. So uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Jennifer. Um, what advice would you give a company about to start development on their first AI product? All right, so maybe the very first thing I would say is like uh, AI product is a very generic and wide term. And I think like people tend to forget that like, wh what does it really mean? Like, does it mean like AI infused product or does it mean a product for AI or for like facilitating the usage of AI, right? Sometimes it's both, right? I mean, so in our case, like that's kind of what we're trying to do, like provide tools and uh, uh, still using AI as, a, as the back engine, right? But at the end, of the day, I think the challenges are very different because the the purpose and the user is very different, right? I mean, so I think like on the one hand, you're trying to deal with like a product that's basically like trying to abstract the, uh, the AI and the machine learning piece like completely away from the user. So you are giving the example of TikTok, right? I don't think anybody really cares like uh, how the engine or the recommendation actually works, right? On the other side, like if you're going to uh, think about like, uh, like some company that's trying to provide like a, a service Services, like helping like generate metrics that are you know, like, uh, it meant for an uh, AI scientist, a machine learning scientist to use, it's very different. And uh, at the bottom of the line, like to me, it comes down to like uh, who is going to be the product manager and how you're going to do your product management. Cool. Um, Peter, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think one of the things around kind of the AI, ML, zeitgeist today, right? AI, if you're talking to investors, ML, if you're talking to people like this room, uh, is is that you know we kind of have these really amazing transformative technologies. I mean, how many people here work on autonomous vehicles? So like pretty decent number. Super exciting tech. Still hasn't materialized yet, but like you know you have these folks in business who you know sit in their car on the way to work and say, wouldn't it be great if I had a self-driving car? Can't wait for that to happen. It's coming. I hear about it in the news, and then they show up to like work and they look around. And they're like, oh, that's a marketing department. I've got a self-driving car. I'm going to have a self-driving marketing department. Let me like get AI, <laughs> and I'm going to replace all this crap, right? And I think the thing that's kind of missing from where like the rubber meets the road in terms of expectations and reality for a lot of projects is, you know, if you think about where ML has actually worked. It's primarily in a consumer setting, right, with the exception of certain things like fraud and risk models. But in consumer setting, you know, Facebook news feed, Twitter timeline, Netflix movie recommendations, right? The the like expectation is much lower, right? When I sit down to watch Netflix, it doesn't like, you know, glue my eyes to the screen, clockwork Warden style, and say, Peter, here's what you're watching today. You know, you're gonna watch this movie. Or like, you know, even Google for a long time, right, just down the road, like Google's user interface before they had the instant search had two buttons, right? There was search. And does anyone remember the other button? <laughs> I'm feeling lucky, right? Like, the idea that you would get the right answer on the first try is like a joke, right? And yet, the way that you sell AI ML in so many cases is like, oh, it's going to solve this problem. You're going to have a complete, you know, uh, 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 you know, you completely replace, you know, the humans or some existing analytics process. So I'd be curious, like, who here is shipping models in production today? Okay, so good, like large number. How many of you have, like, greater than 85% accuracy for those models? Ooh, very few hands. <laughs> so like a fifth. So the question is like, what do you do with models that are like, you can get them from your data, but are kind of shitty to Just, just as an aside, I, uh, anybody who's done any investing uh, or advising, when you do see people say that their model has 95% accuracy, that's usually a red flag, yeah. <laughs> given the number of hands that went yeah. up. So you said 85. <laughs> but no, that's what I mean. So if they say 95, that's usually a red flag. Yeah, so in a nutshell, like one of the things I find really helpful is saying, well, what would you do with the model that you can get, you know, like 70% accuracy or 75% accuracy? And in many cases, you know, you can't replace an existing business process, but you can start to do things like uh, ranking and relevance, or you can give a set of recommendations. And I think that's like a much different mindset than when you expect, when you think about full autonomy or level five or your level five marketing and sales team, um, 
and I think that's just kind of a expectation setting thing, but also one where when the tools we're using are still so low level and ML still feels like magic, uh, that magical expectation le leads to pretty disappointed expectations, especially you know, in the market and, 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 and in terms of actually AI adoption. Yeah, so this reminds me of another point. Um, I was trying to find uh, the, the name of the uh, author of the post. There was a good post the other day, I tweeted it out, um, about uh, data moats. And so I'll, the other thing that comes to mind um, when we talk about starting development on an AI product or building a good AI product, you mentioned Netflix. An example in this post on data moats was that Netflix uh, was often used as an example of a data moat, and they said, okay, our, our, our uh, and I'm, there was a speaker just a minute ago from uh, Netflix, uh, talking about how their recommendation engine differentiated them. Um, but in reality, now they've gone from like something like 80% of streaming uh, share down to like 15 or 16% with Disney Plus and all these other things coming out. So it turns out that, you know, slightly better recommendations maybe isn't as big a moat as people thought it was. Um, and one of the questions of like, is your, you mentioned Google, you mentioned autonomous vehicles. Um, one example that was given of like a real moat might be something like Waze, where when you get enough people using it, it's actually feeding back, it's making the product itself possible. You could do Netflix recommendations without all of Netflix's data in theory, right? Um, anyway, so just as an aside, I, data, uh, is, is, is another important element. But then there's the systems and processes to, to, to deal with those. So Rob, maybe you could um, start there. Like what, what, have you, what challenges have you seen with companies you've worked with on the data infrastructure needed for ML? Yeah, so I think uh, data is, is the most overlooked uh, component in a lot of machine learning models. Um, but first, I want to thank Peter for pointing out that Disney Plus has a subscription service. Um, <laughs> I just remembered they did cancel mine now that Mandalorian um, has finished. It's coming back. It's coming back. <laughs> All right. I'm sure other people in the audience feel the same. Um, uh, yes, I, I don't think I, I included in, in the introduction. I'm, I'm currently writing uh, a book, Human in the Loop Machine Learning. Uh, seven of the 11 chapters are, are out online. So this is something I, I think a, a lot about, uh, the, the data process. And too often, I, I've seen companies you know, hire the PhDs, um, get up to date on the most recent uh, algorithms that they need to build. Um, and then data labeling is, is an afterthought. Um, and even worse, something that's considered so boring that it's completely outsourced. So the data scientists don't even have an intuition for, for what their, their data is. Um, uh, I like really encourage people to flip that around and, and start looking at your data as the very first thing you do. Um, before you start building out your team, like, is this going to be a really easy or really hard data problem? Maybe you don't need um, PhDs like, like us. Like maybe you need the smarter people who dropped out earlier on. Um, and, um, Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have, you have I, I, well? I'm a dropout. OK, yeah, yeah, right. That's the, like, like I said, the smarter people. And um, uh, so in chapter two of my book, you already build a working model. Um, it's a really simple model that, that you can ship, um, you know, write in a few hundred lines of code. Um, and so to tie it to the earlier question as well, what, what you should do when you're starting out with uh, an AI product, yeah, build the, build the version first, which is just a few hundred lines of code, which is still a complete end-to-end -end system where you yourself are adding the labels, so that'll be valuable time that, that you spend um, when you're growing a model, when you can look at the learning curve. Uh, and, and this will tell you, like, oh, actually, you know, my data is really, really sparse. Um, maybe I want an information retrieval algorithm rather than a classification algorithm. Um, or, you know, my, my data is incredibly simple and it's, it's really, really frequent. Um, so I can just use an off-the-shelf model and, and get pretty good accuracy. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so if you have well, like one takeaway for, from all that is uh, look at your data uh, because um, uh, sunlight is the, the best disinfectant. I'm quoting Peter with that. Oh, oh yeah, we had a good conversation about that a while back. Um, so. It's interesting, looking at the data uh, is often the domain of data scientists, but when you're shipping these products, if you're in any company of any size, uh, the people who are dealing with that data includes data scientists, data engineers, product managers, designers now, if it's gonna be some end user facing thing like that Google search box. Um, so, um, uh, Aliona, do you have some thoughts on how you go from a data scientist who's looking at data to the product manager, to the machine learning engineer, um, and how do they effectively work together to, to ship a product like this? 
Great question. I think that um, having a discussion is, is very important and making sure that each person knows what do they do best. So for example, in, at Thematic, we, um, we have a team of um, researchers who are specialists in NLP and AI. Uh, and then we have our development team who know how to really um, build a product, build an architecture. And so they are constantly talking to each other. And when there is a model that needs to be deployed in production, there is a discussion. And ultimately, the development team decides where everything goes. So um, we don't make our um, AI engineers uh, make, make those decisions because they're not trained to do that. I also wanted to comment on uh, the human in the loop and the data and the accuracy. So um, customer feedback analysis is um, it's actually very difficult to say um, what is accurate because um, it's a subjective task. And so one of the insights, um, to echo what you just said, Rob, was um, that for our customers, it was really important to understand how, um, how their results actually coming together. So when we analyzed uh, our first data set is an unsupervised approach, basically discovered themes and what, what customers are saying. We needed to prove to them that the results are actually accurate. But uh, in, for, the, for them, in order to build this trust, they needed to see what the results um, were like and interact with them. And so we ended up building a tool. So before even creating uh, an ultimate product, we built a tool for people to look into the results and see how the model works and then trust the mm -hmm. data and trust that everything works together well. And so now we have this tool in production as part of our system. And we're collecting data in terms of how people are moving uh, moving themes around, organizing them, bringing their domain expertise, and then now we're feeding this back into the so, system. So are the ML engineers in this case working directly with the customer and debugging and helping them understand what the model is doing? So we actually built a very simple interface. So you don't have to be an engineer to operate it. Initially, it was an en engineers and data scientists operating it, but now it's customer success people, and now it's actually customers. So they're modifying the data, cleaning it, so we don't have to worry about labeling it ourselves. So, so that's a good question. So maybe, Jennifer, you can chime in on this. I, we first met, I think, when you were at Atlassian. Sorry. Um, so I was actually just going. OK, over. go ahead. I think so. Atlassian to me was like, it's a beautiful case study for many of the things we just discussed. So I, I'll basically like, explain everything that basically happened. Like when I, and so I basically joined Atlassian as like the, the first person like to put together like a real like centralized initiative on like data science and machine learning. And when I joined the company, there were actually a couple of people you would have called data scientists like on other teams. So Atlassian is extremely decentralized. Like you have a team focusing on Confluence, another one on Jira, another one on you know like the different products that they have, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And so the data science team, the newly formed or newly forming data science team was on the, 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 the cloud side of things. Right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that you had this product analytics people who understood how people used the, the products in and out. And they're actually like a real source of you know, like a, uh, knowledge in there. But they actually never occurred to them to basically bring these people together and basically start an initiative from this, which I think like was mistake number one. right? I mean, so this is something I basically try to fix by actually hiring internally to have like this side of people who are closer to the customer and so forth okay. and so on. So let them talk uh, to the customer, yeah. essentially. And the, the other thing is, like, I, like, I, I really, like, for me, like, this is the perfect, like, uh, software company to some extent, right? Everybody looks up to, uh, to them, like, in terms of how quickly they've grown and how mature they are as an engineering organization. And somehow, I don't think, like, machine learning ever came together, right? And so I think, like, uh, one of the problems I, I can cite there is, like, and that's the reason I joined in the first place, they had this beautiful beautiful data mode, right? And so I think, mm -hmm. like, think about Slack. Slack has, like, really, like, it's, it's a very poor version of what 
the Atlassian data looks like, right? Because they just have like chat data, right? And when I when I joined, like Atlassian still had like a you know, like they a, have a lot of structured data. They had Atlassian. a lot of structured data, and they had like this huge range of different products that were all like really like coming together, and you could really like turn this into like a I can happen exactly what happens in the workplace, right? I mean, so like I think the right product to build would have been like a uh, knowing what kind of conversation is going on on a team. That's something Slack cannot do because if you're sitting yeah. close to me, I'm going to talk to you directly and so forth. At, at, my, at my startup, one of the questions, interview questions we would give candidates was, uh, or challenges, there's a JIRA data set and uh, duplicate detection of JIRA tickets, for example. Yeah. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of applications, yeah. but why do you think, so are, does this imply then if a company doesn't start working AI first or at, on ML or data related things early 100%. that they're going to have trouble catching I up? I don't think you, like you need the right mindset. And so like the problems I've seen is like we were never fully integrated with engineering teams, right? Okay. Uh, I, I was not like, we were not built in a way where I was like prepared to integrate engineers on my team. And eventually when I made that change, uh, we were really like functioning as like a team that was like servicing other teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, it basically we became like some sort of like internal consultancy kind of, uh, and then we didn't have feedback loops. Yeah. In place. We, like, so uh, this might be a good question. So Peter, you said something that feels related when you said it's most, been most successful at consumer companies. So the, the most, one of the most successful examples I can think of is like ad tech, right? It's a pure machine learning problem. The, the, there's very few um, people in your way because it's core to the business. It's making revenue. Um, and then obviously other consumer apps, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, things like that. Uh, do you think that this is really enterprise versus consumer is the root problem? Why, why do enterprise companies have so much difficulty shipping machine learning? It's a great question. There's a, I, think, I think part of it historically has been getting access to data, right? So with, like, no one talks about big data anymore, but if you actually think about what big data means today, like. I think Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery, right? You've moved from like HDFS, which is a cheap file system with no schemas, to S3, where you had ch cheap files in the cloud, no schemas, to now you've got like schemas and large amounts of consolidation. And I think a lot of the data is actually coming from um, SaaS tools, right? Like, I, like, why did Salesforce lead the, in sorry, I'm like, in an investment mindset, but okay, why did Salesforce lead the investment in Snowflake's latest round? It's like you have your sales data and your marketing data and your product data and your first party transaction data all being dumped into a centralized place. And so now you can actually start to pull the stuff together. And so when we talk to like a Fortune 500 company, they're, it, it, you know, the leading 33% are like finally getting done with their digital transformation and consolidating their data. And so now when you want to build like a complex entity resolution system, like it's all kind of in a in one centralized place. And I think that's been a big barrier um, to you, start. So you think that's happened now? You think there are a number of companies that have the data in one place? Uh, or at least enough of it to, to do some damage. Okay. Um, and I think people have kind of, yeah, so I think that I, I would actually claim that if you're not there, you're going to be there, right? There's just such pressure to get to consolidate this data. And from a TCO perspective, you're going to have that. And then the challenge is what do you do with it, right? Like you can't just hook up like a TensorFlow model to like, Tray, like a tray pipeline or like uh, a Zapier pipeline and hit go, right? Like there's actually a complex business workflows that you fit into. And I think if you look at a lot of like the no code or low code, like scripting environments people are building around this and workflow management, that's much more tangible. But given the long tail of the services that people run their business in, whether it's like a marketing automation tool or a sales automation tool or, you know, A-B testing, there's just a huge like ecosystem. I think what we're kind of missing, and sometimes is, this is not what we do, but I think you're kind of missing like the, the brain to connect the workflows. Like if you think about Trey and Zapier as pipes yeah. uh, for taking action, and you think about all these data pipelines as feeding these central repositories, I don't think we've come up with like the repeatable kind of recipes for having some model that's like 75% accurate, making decisions for a substantial fraction of a yep. business user's workflow. And what you see instead is these like verticalized, very verticalized like sales targeting or um, uh, marketing targeting or, or very specific um, applications which work for a specific persona, but like double clicking one level down, like no one's built a very profitable AI platform unless you're selling, you know, consulting services under right. a, uh, you know, bunch there, of marketing. There was another good post from uh, Martin Casado at Andreessen uh, last week uh, talking about um, ML startups that are building tools and frameworks. And I want to talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, but that was basically the point he was making that they start out 
looking like software companies and then they uh, kind of devolve into consulting companies. Um, or you could just start as a consulting company and, and you know, cut out the middleman. Um, but on this note of, um, okay, the data at these, in these big companies, they were getting the data in one place and that was a challenge. Now that the data is there, I mean, one thing that we've been seeing, um, you know, the last two years, I think, on the one hand, research uh, and innovation on archive has continued to explode and accelerate. But I feel like in the enterprise, in many ways, it slowed down for a year or more because everybody was just dealing with GDPR um, and a lot of the um, compliance issues and regulations. So, um, I, I, Aliona, uh, maybe you could speak to this a little bit. You're selling to enterprise customers right now. Yeah. What, what, are, what are you seeing um, in terms of challenges of regulatory overhead? And do you think it's making it harder as an AI startup? Well, when, when I started Thematic, even um, you know, three years ago, it was already um, on enterprises' mind. They have so much compliance that they have to um, uh, consider. And the first time we did this, we did it completely wrong. So it was still me and my co-founder, the two of us, and we tried to sell to PwC. They actually reached out to us. And so we were, we showed them the demo and they liked it and okay, you know, we want to we wanna buy it, but you guys need to pass our security review. Sure. And so they basically started emailing us questions and asking, what about this? What about this? And we are responding to each question. And, it, and we noticed that the, um, the question started to repeat. It just kept going and it, it took us probably a year to close this deal, even though it wasn't such a, such a big um, deal money-wise. And um, what we've learned is that if you are, it doesn't matter if you're a startup, you still have to comply with whatever processes they have in place. And the best way of um, doing this is by being basically prepared. So when they reach out to you, you tell them, um, well, we have SOC 2, which is um, a common um, certification. It takes, um, for, you know, first you do a type 1 exam or a like a review that is not as onerous, and then you have a type two. I don't know if people here had to had to do to go through it. Um, it takes um, it takes weeks, and it costs maybe um, um, ten to twenty thousand um, dollars. But then they know that you've been through it and you're prepared. And what's happening now is, sure, um, you have some. You want us to go through a security review. Let me introduce us. Uh, let me introduce you to our chief security officer, who happened to be the same person. But it doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> and then that's they, a that's a pro tip for the startups out there. Yeah. And then they send you a spreadsheet because SOC two giving access to our SOC two report is not enough. Each company has their own Excel spreadsheet with their own questions, and you just have to go yeah. through and respond to them. And, um, and it, it sounds funny, but it, I mean, titles do matter to big companies, right? Um, anybody who's been in a big company knows this. And as a startup, I mean, one of the strengths you have is flexibility. Um, so it sounds like a joke, but it's, it's, it's true. Like you can, the conversations can go so much faster and so much easier if as a startup you have a chief security officer, right? Well, yeah, and exactly. And so they, they will then know, oh, you take these things ser seriously. Right. This is, the, the, that's great advice. Um, we could go. We could talk endlessly about getting through uh, compliance hurdles. Um, but there, there's another piece that's related to that, and maybe Rob, you could chime in. Um, uh, I, I'm an investor in a company, uh, Fiddler Labs, which is focused on explainability and interpretability, um, and, and compliance is one of the one of the things they're doing. Um, and the thesis there is that it's actually important. It's a, it's one piece of GDPR. Uh, is, is talking about like explain how explainable are these models, especially for things like loan decisions and things like that. Um, do you, do you think that that's a blip, or is that going to be continually more important? Uh, so yeah, I, I think it'll be continually more important that uh, models have to be uh, explainable and they'll be regulated. Um, I'm probably the, the only former CTO in the room who thinks we need more compliance and more regulations. We argue about this all the we, time. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> but we're still friends. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've seen a lot of misuse of, of data in, in a former life working in disaster response, especially in, in uh, conflict areas. Um, so I'm very keen, uh, keenly aware of what, what can happen. Um, uh, I think a lot of it will end up being baked into to what we do. I mean, uh, yeah, SOC 2 is onerous. I've been through it a couple of times, but, but we can do it. We don't know what these standards are going to look like yet. 
Um, but we can be certain uh, that when there are standards for explainability, they're going to be baked into the, the libraries um, that we're using for machine learning. They're going to be, you know, going to be part of SageMaker or AutoML or um, uh, the equivalents on, on Azure. Um, so I, I don't think they're necessarily going to be things that prevent us from doing what we're doing. And if they, they make us slow down a little bit, um, uh, that, that can often be um, uh, pretty positive. I mean, since we're talking about explainability, I think it's a perfect example of like how enforcing compliance is actually helping the machine learning field, right? Because like uh, it's it's not uh, it's not opposed to what you do. In fact, you do want explainability to improve the way you're doing machine learning, get better models, and so forth and so on, right? I mean, so to some extent, I see this as a way of like dragging or getting the attention of the business on where the investments need to be, and there is an opportunity for machine machine learning leaders to basically like turn that into an advantage, right? Did, did people see the controversy uh, on Twitter last week about, um, was it uh, Hinton? Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but basically he said, you know, if, you, if, you're go to, if you're going to a doctor for um, a serious medical uh, procedure, do you want the 90% accurate algorithm that's not explainable or the 80% one that is? Um, and, and so maybe, <laughs> what, right. what are your thoughts on that, Rob? I think that's a really fucking stupid question. I, <laughs> it, it always worries me when someone with um, that much of, a, uh, of an audience uh, gets to pose things like that. So obviously, um, Hinton posed this question uh, trying to defend um, uh, the research that, that he is famous for, which is, you know, like large black box um, neural models. Um, but really, when you think about it, he's making the argument for exactly the opposite. Um, I don't want there to be a future where your only options are a, a black box uh, medical model. And I don't know if it's like trained on, on data like me or how that 90% is, is evaluated versus an 80% accurate human that doesn't have access um, to that um, AI diagnostic tool. I mean, I think that question is, is saying like this is a hellish future that we want to avoid. Um, and so we need to invest more in explainable models and models that can be used as diagnostic assistance uh, to doctors rather than as alternatives. Interesting. Well, uh, peeling back the layers on these black boxes um, is really at the core of the next topic I wanted to discuss, which is ML ops. So to a lot of companies, I would argue, regardless what approach you're using, to the engineering, te engineering teams, to the ops teams, when you have a machine learning team building models using TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever, then they need to deploy it to production. It is now essentially a black box to them. Uh, and they often don't know um, what, how it works. It doesn't fit their normal paradigm for deploying a web app or a mobile app. Um, and so it feels like that's at the root of ML ops is that either we need to modify those existing systems or we need entirely new frameworks for model monitoring, deployment, maybe explainability. Um, so maybe, maybe, Peter, we could kick it back over to you. What, wh what's your view of ML ops um, and, and like what is needed in that space? Yeah, I think it's a good question and you know, a lot of money writing on this question as well. Um, for you look at both open source frameworks like MLflow and then also TFX and then also a bunch of companies. I think, I think the interesting thing that we found, like, at least on the research side, um, is that there's a lot of good ideas in software engineering that, like, at a 10,000 foot view, are kind of like the same thing in in ML ops. And then if you like, if you like, actually implement it, it's like almost the same thing, but a little bit different. So, a couple examples, right? We talk about continuous integration here. Um, you know, it turns out like you can run a continuous integration service for ML and look at, you know, is my validation accuracy, you know. Mm -hmm. Same or better today for, for this model versus the one I had ran before. But there's a pretty cool paper at um, a SysML, the SysML conference. I think it's called now called ML Sys because of trademark issues. But there's a new academic conference called ML Sys. Uh, last year, there's a paper saying, look, if you just keep doing this, you know, where you keep testing on the same validation set, due to basically multiple hypothesis testing, you're gonna you know, use up that budget and suddenly there's a good chance you're gonna ship a crappy model that will look good on the validation set by chance because you're continuing to reuse that. So what do you do? Well, you still have a continuous integration system but you use some fancier statistical tests and it's not like mind blowing but it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. Um, similar thing here, like people talk about robust AI and certifying that an ML model is robust with respect to a training data set. Problems when you deploy it in practice if you're Distribution's a lot different than when you certified on, like you're kind of SOL. Um, but like software also kind of sucks, right? Like most software that we write is buggy 
and like yet the world runs and like air, airplanes don't fall out of the sky and so on. So like one of the things we did in, in our lab was this question of like, well, what if you just took assertions, right, which are like completely incomplete specs of program behavior, like variables not null, and applied them to models. Like if I have a video and I have three frames, like the truck in the middle of the frame should not disappear on the second frame, right? Mm -hmm. Super easy to write, not a complete specification of what object detection behavior should look like. And it turns out like you can actually considerably improve model performance if you write these simple assertions for things you start to see that are broken when you're looking at your validation set. But, you know, again, a little bit of a twist. It's like, if my ML assertion fires, what do I do? Well, if an assertion files, I've got it fires and I have assertions enabled on my, you know, like J JVM, I'll like nuke the JVM, right? But in an ML scenario, like maybe I want to correct the label and retrain. So how do I actually incorporate that? And like there's a lot of like devil in the detail stuff, but the thematic ideas are there. And I guess the last one, I'll just make a plug for the talk tomorrow on ML perf. Like really cool problem as well. How do you measure the performance of an ML model? A lot of GPU and hardware vendors talk about the number of flops they have and the number of images they can process per second. Like my favorite way to process a lot of images per second is to cat them to dev null, um, but it's not super useful. So like, you know, turns out there's a lot of nuance in terms of saying, well, how fast can I train a model to get to a certain level of accuracy? Turns out like time to accuracy is a very useful framework. Is that like radically different than what we had in like spec and TPCH and all of the different, you know, benchmarks we had over the years? No, but it's almost like we're reinventing the software stack with a slight twist, which is I got to think about what does accuracy and the fact that I can continue to evolve these models over time mean. And so my sense is you probably have another 20 years of PhD research and companies to go figure this shit out. It's interesting. You mentioned um, uh, MLPerf uh, and the idea of uh, assertion. So two projects come to mind. There's one, Great Expectations, which is this idea of kind of unit testing and having assertions for model behavior. Um, and that's more of a developer tool for writing code. Um, and then there's a set of um, uh, products and services that are more monitoring model benchmarks and performance. The, my favorite, Papers with Code had a sister's pro, sister, or has a sister project, Soda Bench, uh, so for state-of-the-art uh, uh, benchmarks. And it does exactly that. They have doc, they spin up Docker, uh, do continuous integration for model benchmarks in a, in a small set of areas. And something like click-through prediction, you can see the seven or eight, you know, cutting edge models and how they do on very, the same benchmark data set. Often my argument when I go into advise companies, they have nothing like that set up. And so usually it's this huge archeological expedition to figure out, well, how are your models doing? And so, and this is at like advanced companies, right? So may, maybe not at Facebook, but like everybody else has this problem, I think, where they've had people, different people work there over time, they built some model, you don't even know how it's doing anymore. Um, so I think we're still in the infancy of this like ML monitoring part. Uh, uh, Eliana, what do you think? Um, I, was, I was going to add, so uh, even though we're a tiny company, we do use continuous integration, okay. continuous deployment um, all the time, and I think we, we actually build very similar kind of basic tests to measure model accuracy on um, data that has been labeled, has been looked at. We don't know what sort of results should be accurate. For, for example, if you have 100 um, opinions or pieces of customer feedback, and you're trying to um, find themes across all of them. What are some common themes? One of the attributes is coverage. So how many out of these are my resulting set of themes are, is actually covering? A very simple assertion, as you, as you mean, but it is helping us um, automatically test and iterate. And then on the other hand, again, um, we're reducing the time that people who are reviewing the model results and making them um, more useful we're looking at how much time are we um, saving them. So it used to take um, two hours, now it's taking one hour. So clearly our model is improving, our tooling is improving, so we're looking at these well, sort of things. So what's different about testing for machine learning? Can, can, it, why, can I just use the existing testing frameworks for machine learning models? What, what, what's different when you're testing a machine learning model versus te testing a web app? Or Jennifer, maybe. Yeah, I was actually going to say so, like something that's very interesting is like when I hear uh, what you guys are saying, right? We're always going back to like measuring equals like uh, improving accuracy or validating against accuracy, and so it's almost like 
I think we're we're like we're currently all making that mistake, right? Because like this is what we've all been trained to be. Why is that a mistake? Right? No, and it's it because like you're lacking that conversation with the business side of things, right? I mean, so what I think was actually very interesting, actually, like uh, when I was working at Walmart, Walmart had this crazy idea back in the days that was like three, four years ago, right? I mean, then nobody was really talking about like continuous deployment and testing models or anything, and they wanted to start a team called the metrics and measurement team that was a team of machine learning scientists that was just specifically going to go figure out the right metrics to validate against, which was not accuracy, right? Okay. So of course there is a correlation and so forth and so on, right? And so uh, and so I eventually like started this initiative and so it was an absolute nightmare because you had to go like figure out like the right business people to talk to back in those days. Like they wouldn't really talk to a bunch of engineers and they didn't really like, uh, like understand why they had to give us like specific information but this is broken, right? And it's still broken, it's missing in ma machine learning ops, and I think this is something that needs to be fixed. So, so that's a good point. It, it ties into something else I wanted to discuss, which um, was, you know, we're talking about access to data being important, but a lot of companies um, don't even have good labeled data to know how well they're doing in terms of accuracy. And so, um, you know, I, uh, I was talking to a company the other day that's working on some ML monitoring, and they said one of the challenges when they talk to companies is that they don't have that benchmark in place for accuracy. And so then they end up monitoring other things um, that are, you know, like model predictions, how are they changing over time, without knowing whether they're really getting, you know, better or worse, because you don't know what truth is. Um, but you can imagine, like, for, like, a loan application, you know, like, what's the percentage of approved versus not approved? So that said, I, I think that this is important. A lot of people frame a problem and they have an accuracy metric, but then they forget uh, that the business actually cares about something else. They don't care about, they don't even know what accuracy means. They, they, they care about how many people have had to draw a rock curve for a business unit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, try explaining that. It gets very uh, difficult. Um, but anyway, um, th what they can understand is something related to revenue or sign-ups or churn or things like that. Um, so it, it sounds like that's the direction Walmart was going, was thinking about what are these other metrics, right? Um, so in these cases where you don't have a lot of good data, what, one of the things that's also emerged in the last year uh, more heavily is synthetic data. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Is this a way out of that puzzle of not having good data? Uh, maybe Rob. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The short answer is no. Synthetic data is is probably not a, a way out of your uh, your problem. There's some really cool stuff in in synthetic data, um, uh, and it'll it'll become more popular as a way to augment your label training data. Um, I don't know anyone using only synthetic data in production. Um, I know people using really successful unsupervised techniques, um, but no one faking synthetic data for, for supervised machine learning. And I think you'll find with a lot of these technologies, um, whether it's synthetic data or, or something a little more sophisticated like, like Snorkel, you might have seen like rule-based systems with smart ways to resolve, you'll get that, that um, increase in accuracy really, really quickly, um, but then it'll plateau at a lower level than um, if you have human-labeled data. Um, and something you kind of forget as a scientist is that, okay, great, so I can get my first kick of accuracy really easily with synthetic data and, and then um, do the rest with the labeling. But that means you still have to come up with the, the schema for labeling. You still have to engage a workforce to do the labeling. You still have to do quality control um, over those labels. Uh, so the amount of work uh, that you're actually saving is probably a lot less than what that, that graph uh, would imply. Uh, so for me, I think the most exciting areas in synthetic data aren't where it, you know, it saves your budget for, for labeling. Um, it's where you're able to use synthetic data for rare events. Uh, so for example, uh, for those of you who work in autonomous vehicles, you know, none of your cars have probably seen a runaway stroller come down like the, the sidewalk and jump out. Like the Godfather where it goes down the stairs? Uh, right, like on the train station. In, um, uh, was that the Godfather? I think it was the Untouchables. Oh, Untouchables. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. Wrong, <laughs> wrong mobster movie. Movie trivia, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and they stole it from an earlier film, too. Um, <laughs> thank you. 
Um, uh, and how can I please sidetrack? Right. Uh, so rare events. Um, so you're not going to get that in your raw data, um, but you can simulate that and, and then train your, your vehicle on that. So I think that, that's where it's interesting. I, I need to jump in because this is exactly what we do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can we get an argument here? No, yeah. no. So, so basically, like something like I, I'll give you an example of something that's like untouched. People don't fully understand what's going on over there, right? But we're talking about like a, uh, like a, a quality for like a labeling and so forth and so on. And so we recently like did a lot of free research on like understanding like how bad you can afford your labels to be for the model to still be successful. And turns out, like no, it's like chaos monkey for machine learning yeah, model. So, yeah. <laughs> so basically, like the like what we found out is like of course it depends on the data. It like if you're working with a classifier, it depends on the class. But uh, the the thing that we need to do next, like people are focusing too much on like oh we're gonna do synthetic data to get this perfect data set. Uh, it's it's just like going down a rabbit hole that really doesn't make any sense. What we found is like uh, you had classes that were super super stable against noise, so you can go ahead and get it wrong and label it like a very, with very poor accuracy. You have all the parts of the data, you have to get it perfectly right. Otherwise, everything is completely like messed up in your model, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, th this is an entirely missing framework in terms of understanding how the data, like we're talking about explainability, so this goes into like mm -hmm. data explainability, not model explainability. How is the model impacting the data? Why does it matter that it's labeled properly and so forth and so on? And uh, all labeling companies out there are just thinking about like volume of like labeling, not necessarily thinking about like why am I doing this and what, what is the right way of doing it. Interesting. Peter, do you have any thoughts on the synthetic data topic? Um, I think it's definitely interesting. Uh, my, the things we've seen that work really well is uh, almost what I call said like data scavenging. <laughs> so uh, there's this pretty funny collaboration continues going on, um, the public keywords like snorkel, dry bell. Um, but it was, it was this thing with, with Google where you know, over the course of building out like an internet scale data service or, or any reasonable company, you've got like a bunch of existing services that can do things like topic classification, sentiment analysis, so on. And like, if you're trying to build a new classifier, there's nothing as good as getting hand labeled, you know, hand labeled training data. But it turned out like a lot of these auxiliary services and metrics from previous deployments and so on, all these kind of like organizational resources as a catch all for this, like you can just throw it into your model or use it, you know, if you're really fancy, you can create like a generative model and label, and you can model the source accuracy of each of these alternative sources. But honestly, like majority vote gets you like 90% of the way there. Don't tell my colleague. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> not, but, like, are you sure it's not 95% of the way there? <laughs> yeah. All right. it's, in the, it's in the papers. But like the idea is like, if you have, like people say like, oh, I don't have any training data, but you have like logs, you have clicks, yep. you have all of this extra crap and services where, you know, if you look at what people do, you like train, you get some pre-trained embedding, you like tack on a few categorical features, you fine tune it, like you can do, you can get pretty far with a lot of data that, that you already have in many cases. And I think like, so like on the input side, like scavenging, I think really useful uh, mentality. Like how can I just jam stuff into my you know, feature representation and then trust regularization is going to wash out and that's just total garbage. And then on the interface side, I think also looking at how people interact with models is totally underweighted. Like in enterprise settings, like, like, net, like you, there's very little collection of what users are actually doing and consumer like Netflix and Kindle and all these like devices are logging every single thing that you do to improve quality mm -hmm. post hoc. And I think that's like, just obvious ways to get data where, you know, again, you, you don't get this unless you talk to the product managers and the designers and so on. But otherwise, you know, we call this like the cool term, it's like data exhaust. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, you're like basically just like all this analyst exhaust, user exhaust isn't captured. So, you know, just scavenge on one end and capture the exhaust on the other. Yeah. That's, and then synthetic data, sure, throw it in. Get some alternative data, throw it in as well. It's like more data is better, but there's a lot of data available in an enterprise. It, it's interesting. It's also a mixed bag. Uh, so one observation, coming from a place like LinkedIn, track that, that type of user behavior information carefully. Um, other companies I found, you know, even large, you know, it could be Series D, consumer startup, they may not have any of that tracking in place, right? I think even Slack until, you know, shortly before the IPO didn't really have search tracking in place. And so it, it seems like it should be easy, but many companies, you see a search box, then there's really nothing behind that search box besides like a, a Lucene index or Elasticsearch. Um, so I think that's usually this archaeological expedition when you start a project um, in a big company is figuring out what is tracked and what isn't. What it, um, I wanted to talk about kind of the future of ML, but th this is an interesting area. Um, I wanted to loop back actually to bringing these things together, ML ops and AI product development. Um, we didn't really talk about um, 
the importance of like product managers or um, you know, in my in my view, that's one of the key things that will make or break break a project. What what do you think is like if you could leave somebody with advice before we take questions? What what is your advice on shipping a, su a successful ML product? If you had to say one thing, uh, I'd say start with the uh, the customer problem that you're solving. Um, and unless you're selling to a data scientist, you should be able to explain the problem that you're solving without using the words machine learning or, or AI. And as a technical person, um, it's very difficult to start with a customer problem and actually know which one is the problem and which one isn't. So my advice is to read up on enterprise sales, do a course, <laughs> and know which questions to ask. The typical question is, when do you need it by? What's your timeline? This will give, give you an idea of how urgent it is. Who's the decision maker? Right? Yeah, who, you know, do you have a budget allocated to this and so on? I would say like be obsessed with the problem, not the solution, and make sure that everybody who is involved feels the same way. I think especially towards your comment about you know, archive blowing up and enterprise adoption not, right? You probably don't need a new model architecture, right? You probably can just take a pre-trained embedding and fine-tune it. And it's the, blasphemy. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the hardest part then is, given that you're likely to get a, get a model that's 60 to 80 percent accurate, and a little bit of feature engineering might give you a two or three percent boost. How do you hook that imperfect but hopefully useful model into an existing business workflow and tell people, downstream consumers, like, don't trust these results 100 percent? That's great. That's great advice. Uh, so I think we have uh, some time for questions um, from the audience. And there's two mics yeah. out there. Two mics there. Please uh, come on up. And, and uh... so I have actually some questions about uh, asserts and uh, machine learning pipelines. So these asserts, uh, it seems fairly easy to put them in at uh, test time. Where? Um, where would you put them in at training time, and then how would you act on them? Uh, presumably, the, the assert is something more complicated than just, oh, you have to match this training example. You would presumably want to maybe say some tensor matches some other tensor, something along these lines. Uh, what are some interesting examples of asserts that you've seen either in training time or in general something a little, little unexpected? So we have a plug paper in, in, in uh, MLSYS on, I think the talk is actually on Monday. It's coming Monday, but you know the, the idea is you know you're going to get some assertion that fires. You have to figure out what are you going to do with it, and the assertion you know can be probabilistic, or let's just say it's simple, like objects shouldn't flicker in and out of existence in a spatial-temporal region faster than a thirtieth of a second, right? A thirty-frame video, right? So like there's a couple things you can do. One is you can just correct it, right? You can say, okay, well, great, well I'm going to override the model output. I can put that back into training data, so you can do this kind of override. Um, you can imagine like putting the model on a treadmill at training time, where like you run it, you check the you know uh, validation set, it has these errors, you go back and correct it and, and, and repeat. Um, that's kind of like mining hard examples according to whatever assertions you've given. Uh, you can use it as a way of uh, doing active learning and prioritizing which examples are kind of hard or tricky, like especially when it comes to things like occlusions, right? Um, I don't want to have like cars stacked on top of each other. Well, there may be like a weird, like I mean, it may be that I have two bounding boxes in an object detection model that are actually, um, like there were two objects that were that were occluded, or maybe it just had a you know crappy spurious firing, and there was really only one object. So that's when we want to kick it over to a human and do that in terms of um, active learning. And you can also combine these by like learning the quality of each assertion and weighting your training data accordingly. But the net of it is like you can do a lot of stupid stuff, or let's say the straightforward stuff, and and it's actually pretty useful to then just you know add these. You know, in the loop, and then see which ones which ones actually actually fire. And it's not just for like video. We did it for like EEG data as well, where like you can't detect some. You know, there's some domain-specific properties which, you know, the doctors know. What, there's a certain frequency of events. You put a cap on the frequency of events, and then when the search and fires, you pick which events to throw out. But it's kind of like that uh, iterative process of refinement. And I think that compared to just doing like uncertainty-based sampling for active learning, there are gonna be cases where your models like. Sure, it's wrong, or sure it's right, but like high confidence. But the assertion is using some external information is firing. It's it's interesting the, as you give these examples. I, I don't know that it is is easy in NLP or areas like that, but it, at least in images and videos, it seems like it reminds me. Uh, we have a few physicists in the room. These are like invariants or physical laws 
it must obey the laws of physics, right? So um, maybe if you came, you got a pre-baked testing suite for anything in images and vision that's based on physics, that would be pretty interesting. Yeah, physics tends to have a lot of continuity, so yes. you can make a lot of these, and then yeah, language yeah. is a bit it could uh, be a, discrete. A, a set of simple principles that could then Totally. validate everything, right? Yeah, and there's some really, like, like a best paper at AAAI a couple of years back from Stefano Ermann, like how do you bake physical models into models and so on, like that stuff's amazing. You have these great priors about the physical dynamics, yeah. but like honestly for a lot, of, I mean, if you look at like the um, National Transportation Safety Board review of the, you know, Uber accident, right? They lack like, the most basic mm. QA checks about say continuity and, you know, unless you're gonna adopt a wholesale like cutting edge model architecture that incorporates physical dynamics and so on, like yeah. you just write an assertion and, you know, you can capture a lot of these data. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we can go over here uh, for a question. So last year, this, 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 yep, all right. Last year at this conference, the big theme that was new and different was that we were going to get explainability. And explainability was going, had, had very little attention in the previous five years, but, all of us, but it was going to be significant. And my own initial introduction to this space was in expert systems. I was going to be a knowledge engineer. And it used to be that we thought that people would need to be able to have an explanation that they understood in order to have any confidence in the systems. So I would like to ask the panel what their experience is with respect to explainability. Does it matter? Or is it that people are happy that the thing is a black box and they don't feel capable of understanding it and there's some other method that people are going to be able to use in order to have any confidence in the outcome of the work you're doing? So explainability, does it matter? Jennifer. Okay, so no, I, I think absolutely, I mean, it matters a lot to a lot of people. I actually think like uh, it's probably one of the core problems uh, in research right now. It takes time, right? I mean, because I think uh, uh, even like the way that, you know, like, uh, of course, like feeder labs and company, like of the nature, I think they're doing a, an awesome job of like explaining the model or explaining at inference time. Something I think is completely missing from the framework, which is really going to be useful for the rest of us is basically explaining how at the at training time, right? Because like uh, uh, knowing that you were denied a loan because X, Y, Z reason or whatever, great, it's great for compliance, right? It's not necessarily gonna help you like mm -hmm. assess if you need to change something in your model, if you need to change the architecture and so forth and so on. So I do think it matters a lot. I actually do think there is a lot of progress, but it's a huge, huge problem that basically like lends into like meta learning and a lot of like other complex models. And uh, yeah, I mean, probably doesn't have like, a, I don't think like a, it, it has, a, decent level of attention. I think it's important, but like, they, we need more investments in this area, for sure. Great. Uh, over here. Yeah, first of all, thanks for sharing your thoughts. It's been super, super interesting. Um, on the topic of weak supervision, I feel like I got a little bit of conflicting ideas. Somebody said that it won't take you very far. Somebody else said that it's going to take you really, really far. You guys just like go head to head and kind of give a clear answer. So, so weak supervision, uh, is it a panacea or is it snake oil? Uh, <laughs> who, who wants to go pro and con quickly? Sure, it's snake oil. Oh. <laughs> You're, aren't you writing a book related to this? Um, no, it's, it's not snake oil. Oh. Uh, it is really, um, a, uh, it really depends on the use case. Uh, one of the companies I'm, I'm working with right now uh, use unsupervised models with just really uh, weak supervision. Um, and uh, in their use cases, they're, they're looking at uh, intent for, for enterprise customers for, for marketing. Um, haven't been able to find heavy lifting supervised models which can uh, uh, solve their use case. Uh, so that's super interesting. But you know, like most applications that, that you see out there are supervised. Um, and um, I haven't seen any get really good shortcuts um, uh, that allow them to be what I would call weakly supervised. Um, yeah, but absolutely, yeah, you, you should be using smart things like, like active learning, um, being clever about the interface uh, that people use to give feedback, that can increase efficiency. Thinking about whether that interface is for um, someone you're employing as a professional annotator versus a subject matter expert, or maybe a way for a subject matter expert to give feedback as, as part of their business process. Um, so I think there, there's a lot that we can take away um, from all the weekly supervised literature, um, just not the claim that you won't need uh, labeled data anymore. Weekly labeled data is all you need, is the, maybe the title. That's a la last question. Last question, over here. 
Hi. Oh, sorry. Too short. Hi. Thanks. Um, I have a question about uh, managing stakeholder relationship, especially uh, as a data scientist who practices it um, with product and anyone in product, like the umbrella term. Um, given that the nature of our work is a little bit different, it can be challenging at times to like make a roadmap, who, is, who should be leading that, that roadmap, and if it goes off schedule, like what do you do? Are there any advice that you might have to offer? Um, I understand it's kind of like a loaded question, but it seems like something that comes up time and time again across different organizations. So the question is, uh, stakeholder management as a data scientist, machine learning engineer, how do you manage the roadmap, set expectations of the business? Who's, uh... Maybe I can. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, in my own experience, it makes a huge difference uh, whether, so it depends on the organization, whether you're centralized or not in terms of like large companies tend to have like uh, cases like uh, like Atlassian where everything was centralized in one team and examples like Walmart where, you know, like you have a uh, machine learning scientist, data scientist embedded throughout the organization. I think it helps a lot to have the product manager closer to you and it, it chairman like 100% said like if the person is like the, the dream product manager is an ex uh, machine learning scientist data scientist like, that's the dream, that's like the dream. Yeah. <laughs> so no and absolutely because like you're, you're facing different challenges compared to like software products right I mean so uh, the same would go like project managers because like you know actually what's really different when you manage like or you work with uh, with everything that's related to data you have to schedule for the time you're gonna spend working on it or building the model and uh, you know, like doing feature engineering and so forth and so on, but then the time it takes to train, to test, to go back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? I mean, so it's a uh, you have to manage it at two different levels, and only a person who understands that is going to be successful, making sure you're on time and so forth and so on. The other thing I'm going to say is like. Like I'm gonna say, like AI product management is a little bit opportunistic. So it's it helps if it's like you know, like basically you you never thought that this specific model was gonna go work that well, and that when you see it, you're like, oh really? Like that that should be converted into a product, right? Yep. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, so like proximity and having like a continuous conversation with a person who's gonna do the product management, as opposed to like somebody who sits in another place of the organization, yep. and you're gonna meet with them once a week. I mean, I think uh, is key to uh, to being successful. They need to be in the room where it happens and take advantage of those opportunities, right, <laughs> to quote uh, Hamilton. Um, so th this has been great. I want to thank everybody. Uh, give a hand to our panelists.